Masaki, and I'm on the CUP, uh, Catholics for Unity and Peace Board of Directors, and I am delighted to have with us today as our featured uh, speaker, James Womack Sr. Now, James was born in 1940, and he was the last generation of cotton-picking uh, family in Mississippi. He came from a family of four, and was rejected by his father, sadly, but he was sustained by his mother, and she had the discipline of a soldier, and yet the heart of a clergyman. He was very grateful during their lean times, you know, because they had to make it a go of it, even with vegetables in their garden. And he never even realized how little money that they had. Despite abject poverty, he learned to read and write in the eighth grade. James managed to overcome his circumstances of racism, I mean real racism, and poverty, and proudly walked across the podium to accept his Bachelor of Science degree in business from Butler University, class of 1992. Yeah. He went on, he went to college at 68 years old, go James. <laughs> After, after, after getting four children through high school. So, you know, his son wrote this piece for the bio, and I just think it's just beautiful. This is his son. My admiration and love for my dad came from the many gifts that he shared with his four children and the ideals he always bestowed on me, such as loyalty and inner strength tenacity, honor, and patience, virtues we all need. Dad, James Womack Sr., served in the U.S. Army 21 years, which included one year in Vietnam and 13 years in Germany. He's a father of four, a grandfather of five. He was married for 58 years, and he very sadly, tragically lost his wife following the most horrific rac racist incident. I mean, just horrible. But he contrasts this true and vicious racism with what's going on today. He said, he said to me, we have become so sensitive that we cannot take criticism, sarcasm, jokes, or another person's point of view if it opposes ours. Everything today, paintings, laws, songs, books, statues, movies, art, etc., is either racist or discriminatory. So we must remove everything from history that appears to be racist or discriminatory. He says we have to get tough, come on. On March, on March 25th, 2013, he released his first book, and it's historical autobiography called Black Dad, White Dad, The James Womack Story. And I'm gonna show you that book in a moment. This is a snapshot of black life in Mississippi under Jim Crow rule, and in, in the 40s, and his book came to be uh, because of Christ Renews His Parish. I went through Christ Renews His Parish, and it is a, it, it experience, I experienced massive conversion through it. He was on Chirp Team 4, wow. yeah, at Holy Spirit Geist. And, and in that, following his spiritual witness at Chirp, James's Chirp brothers encouraged him that the world needed to hear his story. Forgiving the unforgivable was the embryo for Black Dad, White Dad, the James Womack story. This man has experienced great, great loss. He's lost his wife. He's lost several of his children. 
and most recently his grandson Cameron. And yet he believes, this is his quote, you've got to embrace this life You've been blessed with love hard. Say the words, say all the words. Stop, listen, pay attention to the messages and guidance that are present all around you. He's a pro-life defender of our Catholic faith. He's a frequent speaker on the topic of the sanctity of life and how abortion is corrupting our values. He's a Knight of Columbus. He's a ser he serves as a lector a faith formation teacher, a choir member. He's in the prison ministry, and he is part of the leaders for America Needs Fatima, and he was on Catholic radio. He's a superstar for our Catholic faith. Please join me in welcoming the author of Black Dad, White Dad, James Womack Sr. Okay. I just thought of that a moment ago. I would like to start this off with a prayer. Oh, Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of Mercy, at this time we entrust the United States of America to your loving care. Open our minds to the great worth of human life and the responsibilities that accompany human freedom. Give us a fresh opportunity for renewal and true solidarity for the common good of our homeland. May we return to our true identity as a people of faith and charity. Help us to always remain one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. 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 We're going to talk about, uh, I, I, I would assume that you have all seen Abby Johnson Unplanned. Now that's a beautiful movie. It exposes uh, the abortion industry. But I want to take you back 11 decades. I want to go back to 1940, actually 1910, okay? In the old Jim Crow uh, law in Mississippi, the Dixocrats, who broke away from the Democratic Party in 1948. They were the landowners, the rulers, they, they were the law enforcement, they were everything, okay? And when they told you to do something, you did it, or you stopped, ble you stopped breathing. During this period of history, 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 98% of black women have been raped by the Klan. If I had a dollar for every every pretty black girl I've gone and got for a clan member, I could buy myself a Lincoln Continental today. And I was too young to even understand what was going on. But it was a situation that you did what you were told to do or you stopped breathing. Now that was rough for black people, but let me tell you something. White women, beautiful white women, were the property of the family. They, they, she was uh, beholden to uncles, aunts, cousins, anybody that wanted her could have her, okay? This situation produced a lot of women, and that, you've heard the old saying, maybe keep it in the family. Mm -hmm. Have you heard that? That's a Southern phrase. That means for white women, if they were pretty, that she was not to be touched by another man outside of the family line. Okay, there's some other truths out there, but we have to accept those to understand uh, what's going on today. Now, this situation created a situation of multiple births. There were rapes, and there was a lot of these women did not want to have a, ma a baby implanted by a rapist. So that became a rich ground for Margaret Singer to work in. Now let's talk about Margaret Singer for a minute. Margaret Singer was born about 1887, and she was a woman that had a troubled life. She had uh, she had a troubled pregnancy. She had a hard time having kids. She had three kids, and she had multiple uh, miscarriages. And she felt that a woman 
should have the right to control her body. Whether or not she wanted to get pregnant or not, she had the right to control her body. Now, Margaret Singer was a member of the eugenics group, and she was a member of, uh, she was also one of those people that believed in evolution. Now, eugenics, if you go and look, there was about 18 or 20 prominent families. Kennedy's and the Rothschilds was involved. This is during the 1880s. They decided that if they could put enough drugs and guns in the hands of the poorest people in the city, they would kill themselves off and they would not become a liability for them to have to take care of. Margaret Singer enters the picture, and of course, Margaret Singer was uh, believed in evolution. And for those people that believe in evolution, <clears throat> they don't believe in creation. <coughs> Pardon me. They believe that the black man evolved from an ape. And since we came from an ape, we were not fully human. So it was okay for them to get rid of us at will. Okay, she went down south and she started, her and her sister started organizations in the south uh, to eliminate the black race. She, her first, uh, her first organization that she created was called the Negro Project. The Negro Project sterilized black men without their knowledge. Wow. And when she found out, when it was found out, she went to jail for that, okay? She got out of jail and came back. She joined up with her sister and they started an organization called the Mississippi Appendectomy. You can check that, that's on your cell phone. It's, it's out there, the information's out there if you know what you're looking for. The Mississippi Appendectomy tied the tubes of black women they thought was not pretty enough to have a baby, okay? <laughs> she was an evil, evil woman, okay? Um, <clears throat> that was the start uh, when she moved into this situation, this mecca of people having abortions. This was her ideal way to get rid of the black race. Um, She started, she was very, very effective with black ministers in the South, Mississippi, Georgia, or Alabama. She went around and she convinced preachers to convince pregnant black women that it was a greater act of love to kill their babies out of love than to bring them into a world of poverty, okay? So many of the black ministers in the South were, were doing her work for her. Thank God, my mother was a Christian uh, and, and believed in the sanctity of life. At the age of 68, I discovered my, my mother had been raped by the Klan every first Friday for the first 13 years of my life, okay? Um, Margaret Singer needed some help though. She didn't, it was going slow for her, it was going bad for her. She was having a lot of time and the government really had their fingers on her watching to make sure that she was doing the right things. Now we get up to 1963, we have the court case Roe v. Wade. Donna McGarvey was a liberated white feminist out of Chicago. She was an atheist. She was a very, very good attorney. Thurgood Marshall got appointed to the Supreme Court by the Republican Party. There was something in Vietnam that President Johnson wanted to do and Congress would not allow him to do it. And the Republican minority came to him and said, look, give us our first black Supreme Court Justice, and we will let you do what you want to do in Vietnam. That is the way Thurgood Marshall got into the Supreme Court. And 
if you read the story of his life, it's kind of interesting. His mother taught him civil disobedience. <laughs> they grew up in uh, grew up in Baltimore, and about 1910, 1920, they started putting up light poles on street corners. And his mother, when she saw this happening, she went out there and confronted the electricians, and she said, "Hey, what are you doing?" No, you're not putting it on my property. She took her, her rocking chair and sat on the street corner mm -hmm. for four days. And finally, the city said, the heck with this woman. We're going somewhere else. So that's where he got his start in civil disobedience. Now, about the time that uh, Thurgood Marshall became the Supreme Court Justice in 63 was when the sit-in started in Washington, D.C. They were sitting, locking up black students because they tried to sit in in white restaurants. Thurgood Marshall formed a team of five attorneys. Johnny McCarvey was one of those attorneys. And they would go and post bail for the students to get them out of jail, okay? And one night, one Friday night, it was storming. They could not work the streets. So the question was asked, what law out there do we need to consider that's not being challenged? Nobody could come up with an answer. The next morning they said, well, you know, if a woman uh, wanted to have a baby, wanted to get rid of her baby, there's no law to protect her. So Donna McGarvey agreed to be Jane Doe, okay? So they created this case called Roe v. Wade. Donna McCarvey was Roe and Roe v. Wade, okay? Thurgood took this court case. Now, let me stop a minute. If you understand our government, who makes laws in this country? The legislature, right? What is the job of the Supreme Court? To interpret the law. Thurgood Marshall argued and won Roe v. Wade based on the idea that the woman had been brutally raped, became pregnant, and did not want to keep her child. It became law. As soon as it became law, it was open up to all women, whether raped or not. Okay, that's the way Roe v. Wade came. Roe v. Wade was a big lie. And this is something that they, they're looking at now. As a matter of fact, even uh, Mrs. Ginsburg has said it was not right. It was, it, it's not a real law because it's based on a lie. There was no rape in Roe v. Wade. Okay. Uh, let me give my thoughts together. I'm sorry. No, you're uh, When Roe v. Wade got passed, Gloria Steinem came onto the scene. Now, everybody here knows Gloria Steinem, right? An activist, a feminist. She is the founder of Ms. Magazine, and she uh, was the president of the National Organization of Women. She told women, look, you don't need a man, you don't need babies, and you don't need a family. Go to school, get your degree, and be independent. Now, women listen to her all over this country. You women of the 60s, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Women threw their bras away, they were having sex with anybody they wanted to. They, they, uh, they uh, get pregnant, they just go take the pill and get rid of it. Go to abortion trying to get rid of it. Now, about 1965, 1965, 66, FDA approved the birth control pill. Based on all the work that Margaret Singer had been doing, she got started back in the 20s. It took them a long, long time to actually approve the birth control pill. And when the birth control pill was approved, it was approved for married women only, and the husband had to sign for his wife to get the birth control pill. 
That's kind of a story of the birth control pill, where it came from, okay? Now, uh, Gloria Steinem, they don't tell you what happened uh, after telling women for 25 years, you don't need a man. Guess what she did when she was 65 years old? She ran off to Africa and married an Englishman. Okay? <laughs> okay? She ran off and got married. Now, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about this time in history because there was a lot of abortions going on, a lot of abortions. Everybody got this idea, a woman's right. Now, Gloria Steinem is responsible for a woman's reproductive rights. You go to the dictionary, you will not find reproductive rights in the dictionary. Now, reproductive is a positive, uplifting word, not negative. Reproductive, the way it's interpreted by her, is the right to kill your baby. Okay? Unfortunately, women all over the world listen to Margaret Sanger. Three years ago, we did um, That Man Is You. Now, St. Louis de Montfort is running the course right now. In the eighth chapter, it talked about the disappearing West. When God created woman, he intended for each female to have two live births. Now we know that every woman can't have, you know, they, they don't have, every woman can't have children. But as long as there, there are an average of two, that is considered a replacement rate. And that man is you, they looked at Europe, all of Europe right now, Germany, France, Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, Spain, Italy, Russia, they're at 0.5. At 0.5, those races will disappear in about 35 years because they are not replacing themselves. The United States is running right now at 1.2 uh, replacement rate. And at 1.2, we will last about 42 years. Now the census figures reported that the period of, two, of 1963 to 2012, there were 60 million abortions in America. Now these are American abortions, not worldwide. 51 million, or 85% of those abortions were black. Now, I was pretty good in math in high school, and I, I knew how to figure, if you get three numbers, if you get three facts, you can find the fourth fact. And if it took 63 years to, redu to, to destroy 85% of the black population, how long would it take to destroy the remaining 15%? 8.5 years, if abortion keeps at the rate it's going. But guess what? The world is browning. Everybody's talking about, oh, the world is browning. It's browning, you know. The reason it's browning is that Mexicans do not take birth control pills. Mexicans are having an average of six births per woman. Muslims can have four wives and they are having eight children per third woman. So guess what the world's gonna look like about 20 years from now? It's gonna be Mexicans and Muslims. Not because of immigration problems or anything else except the abortion pill. Because our abortion pill, and I'm gonna say this, it may sound cruel, but I'm gonna say it. White women have stopped having babies. They go to college, they get beautiful de degrees and they run companies and they will date you and they will cook you a beautiful microwavable meal but they do not <laughs> want to get married 
and have kids, okay? <laughs> so the white race is disappearing because of the abortion pill, okay? So we're in for a new day. If, if it doesn't turn around, it's in for a new day. Now, being a business manager, I was interested because they got into the practice of selling baby parts. I don't know when it started, but the lady down in uh, the lady down in uh, um, Texas was bragging about buying a Lamborghini with the money that she got from selling baby parts. And I had a flyer to give out. Now this is this is hard to look at. This is hard to look at. Okay. But let me do a little bit of explaining here. On the very first page, you see, uh, is the census figures from American abortions from 1963 to 2012, the 60 million babies. Look at the income that they produced. I can't even say it. That's 77 trillion. Why are we paying taxpayer money to support them? when they are making that kind of money, okay? Now, the fallacy with that picture is that we don't know, or it doesn't take into consideration when baby parts start to be sold. So, so it's not, the 77 trade does, is not really a true figure because of the fact that we don't know when they started. Now, if you flip over to the next page, the email I got from uh, Vicki showed us that there was a total of um, 42 uh, million abortions uh, in the year of 2019. Now that, that 42 billion abortions, if they were sold at the price of 12.95, produced uh, Fifty-four trillion three hundred ninety million dollars. Thank you. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. We get numbers that big. I'm not used. To this. Okay, okay. But this industry needs to be disembarked. Now, Trump is the only president in the history of America that has supported pro-life. Okay, he went to our pro-life meeting. He's, he's met with pro-life speakers in Washington, D.C. He is pro-life. Everybody's trying to say the man is prejudiced, that he's racist, okay? Believe what you want to believe, but, but you have to look at facts. What is he doing? Does, does what he does support the facts that he's racist? No, it does not. It does not, okay? Uh, so we need to pray for him. We need to pray for another Supreme Court justice to place to replace Ginsburg, okay? And hopefully, at some point in line, they're going to have to realize that Roe v. Wade is a lie. There was no rape in Roe v. Wade. Okay? Uh, that will end my little spill that I had, and I would like to end this with a prayer. I would like to end my talk and then I'll let you ask questions. Okay. Uh, well, I've lost, I can't find it. Hold on now. Eternal God, in whom mercy is endless and the treasure of comp co compassion inexhaustible, look kindly upon us and increase your mercy in us that in difficult moments, we might not despair, but nor become despondent, but with great confidence submit ourselves to your holy will, which is love and mercy in itself. Okay? Now, I will entertain questions if you have any questions about anything that I've covered so far. So, so I had a question for you, James. Okay. Um, Obviously, what, what you described at the beginning um, with Margaret Sanger 
was the intention to try to go after women because they were being raped. But I, I've heard all sorts of stories that she was trying to really eradicate the race. She was. So could you explain a little bit more about that? Well, in her book, The Pivot of Civilization, which was so damaging to her cause that when Roe v. Wade became active, she bought up the copyright and burned the book. The book has been burned. You cannot find Roe v. Wade out there. In her book, about no way through, she says, if you are not English blue blood with blonde hair and blue eyes, you do not have the right to procreate. Now, she was German with brown, dark brown hair and dark brown eyes. If her policy had been enforced, she would not have been born, but she would have been aborted, okay? Sorry. Could you repeat her question? Where did Margaret Sanger's hatred come from? Let me get oh, okay. Into the mic. Okay. Where, where did Margaret Sanger's hatred come from? Well, she was a member of the eugenics groups, and she was one of Hitler's best students. Oh. And I think. Uh, in that, uh, see, the eugenics people were looking at imperfect bodies, the, the, the children that were born with diseases, with ailments, and they wanted to eliminate those people because they said that would be a, a, a liability that we have to take care of. And the fact that uh, Margaret Singer was a... Um, um, the opposite of creation. She was uh, believed in. You, um, Euthanasia. No, no. She. Eugenics? Uh, now, just a minute. Just a minute. Evolution. evolution. Oh. Because she believed in evolution, she did not see black people as being people. She said that we, 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 we arrived from monkeys, and because we arrived from monkeys, we were not considered to be legitimate people. It's, it's, it was no problem with just getting rid of us, okay? I had one other question, James, okay. and it had to do with the, um, I, and I'm trying to remember the appendectomy that you talked about. Mississippi appendectomy. What is a Mississippi appendectomy? What is that? If it, it was an organization that her and her sister started, and what they did, if a black woman went to the hospital for any reason, okay. they tied her tubes. Mm. They did not want them to be able to reproduce. Well, you have to, now these women were having babies after babies after babies. They were just, you know, they were being raped. And I can almost understand the frustration of women in those days. They had no control. Because when the Klan come up and told you to drop your pennies, you didn't. You stopped breathing. Okay? You had no choice. Well, this, this is a segue to that because there's, there's so much unrest right now. We have a question from the audience. I think you're in a unique perspective. Can you address the current racial unrest and how we get past it? And that's a tough question for anybody. Well, it's not tough for me because I am aware of President Obama's tenure in Washington, D.C. If history is fair, Obama will have to go down as being the worst president that we ever had, wow. okay? In his second term in Washington, D.C., in, in Illinois, as a gov uh, senator in Illinois, he signed the first Born Alive bill you can go back and check his record. The Born Alive Bill says that if the if an abortion doc if a, if a woman is having an abortion, and if the baby slips through the hands of the first doctor, he authorized a second doctor to go ahead and kill the baby anyway. 
Now, as a black president, he did not understand that the abortion industry was trying to destroy us. But he signed a bill authorizing, you know, that you could kill the baby anyway. And I know this from friends in, in, in England. Black Lives Matter got started under President Obama. It was chaired by, by um, not Farrakhan, um, Sharpton, Al Sharpton. Now, for those of you who don't know, Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson are both members of the American Communist Party. Now, back in the 60s and the 50s and 60s, if you were a member of the American Communist Party, you couldn't do nothing. If you were an actor, you were blacklisted. If you were a writer, your, your, your writing would not be accepted. It is blacklisted. Now, Black Lives Matter was started under Obama with the mission to kill white cops. He felt that if he could stop cops from doing their jobs, if he could get it up to 80%, he could have a, uh, uh, what you call it? Um, no, he, 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 you couldn't have an, uh, an election. He, he could call for, a, right. Uh, and they actually got it up to 37%. They got it up to 37%. The killing of white cops started under the Obama administration. Okay, now this is something nobody wants to talk about. And I have been told, I, I, I can't talk to most black people. I'm, I'm immediately told, man, you're too white to know what it is to be black. Okay, they don't want to hear. They have been so brainwashed, they do not. And I said, well, go to the books, go get the books out, go to the library, go read for yourself and you will understand. But it's, it's a lot of call. As a matter of fact, you know, I was a substitute teacher in Lawrence Township School City for 10 years. And I had a class at uh, Craig, I gotta tell you this because it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, it was the day before Obama was elected the first time. I had a class of 30 students. I had 20 black males and 10 females. The black males were all Haitian. And I didn't know that going in, but they came in the classroom, they were so, rowdy i had to call the principal to get their discipline so i could take take role now the girls come in took their books out went to the desk sit down and start doing what they were doing the black male was throwing spitballs when i called the first name i did not announce it correctly and they laughed at me so i took the first kid that laughed and i handed him the roster i said now you call the names and i will check them off so when I got through the full roster, I said, now look, let me tell you something. I have had 16 years of English. I've had four years of Latin. I've had two years of Spanish and I speak German, but I don't speak Haitian yet. <laughs> they all laughed and thought it was funny. And at the end of class, this little short kid about this high, pants down to his knees, uh, jury hanging all off his neck, Con Rose. He walked up to me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, Mister, you know something? You ain't black enough to teach me, and walked out. If you're not talking that lingo, and I'll tell you something else that happened to me. My Black Lives Matter member. If you look at the back of my car, I've got the sign on the abortion stops a beating heart. Now, I've got to clean this up a little bit. I can't use the language that he used that way. But the man walked up to me. He looked at my car and he, he, he was dressed with, a, with a, a conservative dress. He had a black suit and a necktie on. I thought he was a minister. I was coming out of Thornton's on uh, Pelham Pike and he walked up to me, he looked at the side of my car and said, you blank ass Republican, don't you think a woman has the right to kill a baby if she wants to? And when I get people like that, I, I can talk stupid. I can talk the language, but I need to. I said, sir, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry 
but I didn't have sex with her. I did not get her pregnant. So why is my government making me pay for it? I said, you know something? I would like to have a Lamborghini. How would you like it if the government took part of your paycheck to help me pay for my Lamborghini? He says, oh, he called me some names I can't say. He says, and you don't support Black Lives Matter either, do you? I said, no, hell no. He said, why not? I said, because last year in the month of June in Chicago, 400 black men got shot. 369 died. Black Lives Matter did not say a word about those killers. But he said, oh, you damn right, you damn right. That's a gun control issue. We don't get involved with gun control issues. Now you better get your black ass out of here before I let you flat. Turn around walk away. Wow. Okay? I'm sorry. I'm, any other questions? <laughs> that one over here. How do you think it happened that the black community became so engrossed in the Democratic Party and believes all this? I wish that. I... How did the black community become so engrossed and involved in the Democratic Party? I will tell you. I've got a picture of the Washington Times the day that Johnson took office and it's written in great big bold letters. It says, and I'll, I'll, I'll send you a copy of it. I'll, I'll send it to you. You can send it out to people you want to send it to. The statement says, these uppity niggers are getting out of control, but I've come up with a policy that will keep them voting Democrats for the next 200 years. That's the day he introduced food stamps. Okay. Now, I was in Walmart two days ago, and there were two beautiful young black ladies in front of me. They were fairly well educated. One had a baby, and the other one didn't. And the girl with the baby had asked her girlfriend, hey, did you go on that job interview? She said, yes, I did. She said, what did you think of it? She said, oh, it was a fabulous job. The pay and the benefits was good. She says, you took it, didn't you? No, I didn't. Why not? I'd have lost my food stamps. Okay? They are so brain into that support. See, I'm a, I'm, I, I'm a member, I believe that I am a victim of my decisions, not my circumstances. I'd like to talk to you a, a, a moment, if I may about people that should have been aborted. Tony Melendez was one of those people, his, his mother, his mother had taken birth control for 10 years. And see, women don't realize this, but a long-term use of the birth control pill renders your body, it messes up, you can't have kids, okay? And that was the whole idea behind the birth control pills. Now, Tony Melendez, his mother had taken Taking, now let me go back to, to, okay, taking birth control pill for 10 years. He was born with no arms, no arms at all. Tony Melendez plays classical guitar with his toes. When the Pope came over here in 92, Tony played for him. Get some. Hey, I've got, I've got 10 fingers. I can't play classical guitar. Let me go back to Donna McGarvey for a moment, who played Jane Doe in Roe v. Wade. I forgot this. She was an atheist. Ten years after Roe v. Wade was passed, she became Catholic. She was converted to Catholicism. And she was living out in uh, Missouri. And the long-term use of the birth control pill had made her infertile. She went into a birth control clinic one day to see if she could get information on how to get pregnant because she wanted to have a family. And they showed her a refrigerator full of dead bodies. It made her so sick she vomited. And she went on America and begged America, forgive me for my part and Roe v. Wade. I was not raped. Now, you never get this that side of the picture, they will, there's no news media that will publish that. Um, one of the things I got, hold on, I'll pull it right quick. Is this the 
Isn't that fabulous? Yes. Yeah. I mean, because what he's exposing are the lies. And uh, some of this I haven't, I've never heard, never heard. Now this, this comes from lifenews.com. Abortion is the leading cause of death due to coronavirus, killing 1.5 million worldwide. Now, if you want to have your mind blown when you go home, go on YouTube and put in abortion deaths. Abortions are no safer today than they were 100 years ago. Women are dying, they're bleeding out. That is why some of the states have insisted that the abortion doctor have to have admitting privileges to a hospital because the woman starts bleeding out, they can't help her. They send her home to die. But the news movement, they, they won't print that because that's negative. We can't have anything to disrupt our very profitable child selling services. You know, and if a human being, if they say it's not a baby, their argument is not a baby, it's not a human being. Well, if it's not a human being, how can they sell parts to help other human beings? It's either human or it's not, okay? And uh, they've stopped uh, several of the, the, the uh, the, the pills they've been working on for this virus, they were making it with tissue from unborn babies. And now they have stopped that, so. But this is, this is something else. This is something you won't read in the newspaper. You won't read in the newspapers. You won't do it unless you go and the, And you know what, when I talk to people, uh, they say, oh, you've been brainwashed. You've been, you, you just, uh, Dumb Republican, you've been brainwashed all your life. I wrote, I got involved with the pro-life movement, 40 Days for Life. I started praying with 40 Days for Life. We prayed the Planned Parenthood closed in Fishers. And I went to hear Avina uh, speak when she was here at the meeting. And then I really started getting concerned. I started paying attention, digging, and I've come up with a lot of information. Now, I wrote the article, I wrote an article, uh, Margaret's, uh, Margaret's uh, abortion is the reincarnation of Margaret Singer, and I happened to give her a copy. And uh, she read it and she says, oh my God, you know, one of the female veterans at my VFW, I gave her my article and she read it and she came back. And she said, wow, you taught me things I didn't know about abortion, but I still think a woman has the right to kill a baby. So I looked at her and I said, Judy, you and I have been friends for a long time. Now be, be truthful with me. Look me in the eyes and tell me, if you were discovered that Margaret Singer was black and she designed the abortion pill to get rid of the white race, would you still feel that way? She stumped her feet and walked away and said, we can't talk about this no more. Uh, so one of the questions from the audience was, who buys the baby parts, if you know? I, I have no idea. I have no idea, but I know it's a big market. As a matter of fact, that, that list you've got, this is published by Planned Parenthood that they sell those parts, and that's, that's how much they're worth. Now, they're talking about the removal market is removing all the statues and signs. The first thing they should do in America is remove Planned Parenthood, okay? So, we actually, we have one answer from the audience, okay. and LabCorp, I don't know if you're familiar with LabCorp, but they're one of the purchasers of the baby parts and one of the derivatives of using them is they use it for flavor enhancement. It's just, it's just so tragic. I did want to bring up, you know, with 40 Days for Life, one of the ways that you can act, because you say to yourself, what can I do, right? If you haven't signed up 
to go and pray in front of Planned Parenthood at 86th and near De um, Georgetown. Ta Georgetown Road. Uh, it, it's peaceful. You carry a sign. You pray. And it's, and it's effective. And it's very safe. And it's very safe. It's very safe. I highly encourage you, Google 40 Days for Life and sign up. Sign up to be a prayer warrior there. There's another opportunity too, as you see here, right to life. And there's a fabulous speaker, Ryan Bromberger, Bomberger, who's from Radiance Foundation, who exposes how, again, it's black genocide that's going on with babies. And this is free, it's virtual on October 6th. And so I encourage you to sign up for that. So science and industry. So science and industry, you can Google this. If people are refuting that the, a baby is not a baby from the moment that they are at, at conception, science and industry, you can Google and the doctors will walk you through the scientific evidence so that you can have an intelligent discussion with people that are trying to refute the truth. Thank you, I appreciate that. Theology of the body gives you the perfect recipe. Yeah. A yeah. woman is only fertile 10 days out of the month. Mm -hmm. If she abstains from sex during those 10 days and know how to take her temperature, she can avoid becoming pregnant. But then that doesn't fit the mold. You know, what was the school system that they was trying to bring in? Uh, oh, I'm, 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 I'm losing my mind now. The school system, it was uh, that they wanted to bring in, and when they looked at it and read it, they said, oh, no, hell no, we're not going to do it. Uh, you mean 1619? No, not 1619, no. Uh, it was a whole system that they were going to replace the public school system with. I, I can't. I'll, I'll think of it in a moment. But in that system, they were going to start with third graders, having them bring cucumbers and condoms to school, and they was going to introduce third graders to sex. And you've got uh, uh, Tic Tac, there's one of the movies out there now that's, that's got, got games out there for third graders. They tell all the parents to get on the phone. Get on the computer, become computer literate, know what your kids are looking at, because it's being introduced down, down, down. You know, uh, it's just wrong. We can't teach them about church, we can't teach them about God, but we can teach them human sexuality. In the third grade, no, I'm sorry. They don't need to, their minds are not ready for sex at the third grade. The other thing that's kind of tough is if your child at, is at school or out somewhere, they can't give them a Tylenol, and yet they can offer them the abortion pill. Yes. And they can have them go without parents' um, signature to have an abortion. Yep. Yeah, so the, the comment was that our children in school cannot be given a Tylenol but they can be, uh, through their own freedom, given an abortion pill. Mm -hmm. or, or actually just go to or, have an abortion. Or go to, go to a facility to get that. Yeah. And I think this is one of the things that uh, the schools are, are concerned right now with the virtual learning because they're trying to promote uh, this kind of sex education and free talk with the kids and because the kids are using virtual learning at home with parents uh, present, uh, they can't freely uh, share their uh, thoughts and impart their indoctrination with the children, uh, which that's the only good side of the virtual learning. 
you know, with, with these kids during the coronavirus period? Common Core was the education system that nobody knew what was in it until they, it was kind of like Obama, yeah. healthcare, nobody knew what was in it until they read it. And when they read it and discovered that that was in at the third grade level, they said, oh no, but hell no, we can't put this in our school system. Okay, final question. Any final question? Tom Rankin, my wife, Amy, we came down from Lafayette to hear you speak, Mr. Wilmack. I don't know, I, I've heard this. I don't know if it's true, maybe you have knowledge on it, that with the new COVID vaccine they're designing, some or all are used, that there's, there's fetuses, mm -hmm. a child fetus involved in the manufacturing of the COVID vaccine. Do you have any knowledge of that? They and were using it. I have no I'm, 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 I'm sending out the, uh, they got back uh, lash from high authorities and they have stopped using it, but it was used in the early development of the COVID vaccine. Yes, that's true. It? Supposedly. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> Vicky, Vicky and James, I'd like to make a bit of a comment to all of you based on what you said about Obama. Uh -huh. Come on up here. Sure. So, thank you very much. I live in Hamilton County. I've run my precinct poll for almost 20 years. I belong to Our Lady of Mount Carmel. A lot of my neighbors belong to Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Historically, my precinct would vote somewhere between three and seven percent for Democrats. Think of that. When Obama ran the first time, my precinct gave him 63 percent of our votes to Obama. So I asked my neighbors, what happened? Well, you know, he was a black man and we didn't want to vote against a black man. So we, we did it to ourselves. Don't let anybody kid you. We elected that man. He said that he was going to transform America. He didn't lie. He said he was going to transform America. We are still living with what he started. And we haven't figured out yet how to Get rid of it. Put that genie back in the bottle. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Okay. So I, I want to close out for just an excerpt. If James, uh, his books did not come in in time for the speaking event. Our next present, uh, we're actually going to um, honor our Blessed Mother, uh, Our Lady of Fatima, America Needs Fatima. We're partnering with them on October 10th. And we very fortunately, through uh, the gracious help of Jeff Worrell, who is the chair of City County Council, we have got on October 10th, Saturday at noon, the Veterans Memorial right there on Carmel Civic Square because you want to play, pray a public rosary on October 10th. And this is gonna be at the exact same time, same day across the whole nation. And so we hope you come out. James will bring his book for that and you can buy it from him there and he will autograph it. But I'm just gonna read one uh, brief excerpt. And this is from early on in his eighth grade and his whole life began to change. The priests and nuns were a blessing of monumental significance. They provided clear life uh, crystal clear life solutions with biblical bases. Their solutions to life, most confusing and perplexing questions were either a solid black or white. There were no shades of gray. This sense of clearly defined black and white issues was completely contrary to the Baptist minister's liberation theology to which I'd been exposed throughout my young life. The teachings of liberation theology were camouflaged in many shades of gray and were heavily shrouded in unadulterated hatred and mistrust of whites. So just a beautiful book. I encourage you to get this and I hope to see you on October 10th. Let's close out with praying the Hail Mary.
process, amen. And can we thank James Place? Yeah, so this is being video recorded and he has his essay, his transcript, and that will be, uh, we'll get that up on our website and we'll get that out to our CUP supporters. Thanks and God bless.